My name is Oscar, and what you're seeing here is a picture of my Finnish lap hound, Java. So, as far as programming languages are concerned, I'm a Java fan, uh, at least for the language. The dog eats my shoes and my hamburgers, so mixed feelings there. But the language, I'm a fan. I work as a back-end developer and a Scrum Master for Squid. Um, and last Java forum, I spoke about Jokto, which is an awesome, awesome product. So if you haven't heard of it, please check it out. But today, I'm actually here to talk about something that I had a major problem with. So the reason for this presentation is actually I was looking at the collections costs, and there was a static utility method called max. And this is how it looks in Java 1.4. It takes some kind of collection, and then it returns an object that represents the ma maximum in that collection. And it's kind of self-explanatory. I mean, you can see from the signature pretty much what it does. It's pretty straightforward. So how does this function actually look with generics? How does the function look like that I saw? Well, in Java 8, it actually looks like this. And maybe this is clear and uh, trivial for you, but for me, uh, this was a little too much. So this with generics, I put the subject for at a side for a while, and then after a while I decided, yeah, maybe it's time for me to get better at generics. So I started researching it, and I found a few things that I thought was pretty interesting, and it really made me look at uh, Java in a different way. For example, did you know that Java generics are Turing complete? Has anyone actually heard that the Java generics are Turing complete before? No one? Yeah, so this actually places uh, Java generics in the same club as C++ templates, the Scala type system, and actually the rules for Magic the Gathering. Anyhow, so more seriously, the real purpose of this presentation is to share some of the things that I found interesting and that hopefully they'll be interesting and useful for you in the future. So, first off, why do we want generics? And this is a serious question. They're like always being there. But why do we really want them? What's the purpose? Anyone? Yeah, exactly. Avoid type files. That's a really good one. And that's a, one of the major features of it. So, if you look at uh, before generics, if we wanted a list of strings or a list of integers, they were represented by the same instance. So uh, they were all represented by the same list. And uh, the problem with this is that it's really neat and it's really simple, but it has no concept of what we're actually putting into that list. So say we have this list where we want to pl put uh, we want to put integers then we can, might, we can also add strings. And the problem here is that the compiler does not have enough information so that it can determine that this is an, uh, an unlawful operation. And what's also bad with this is that the problem, the error is actually made here, but it will be, det it will be detected somewhere else. So, for example, the user will have to cast it to get it back. And what happens when we try to cast that string? Well, they get a class cast exception. So this is really not what we want to have. The language is, in a sense, Java, the language is really simple in terms of uh, pretty simple rules. But maybe it was too simple in the sense that we couldn't represent the content. An example of this is if we look at, yeah, again, the max function from Java 1.4. It, it looks simple, but it does place some responsibility on the developer. You have to cast the uh, object that is returned to the right type. You have to ensure that the objects that uh, are passed to it are actually implement the comparable interface. Otherwise, you will get the class class the exception. So in a sense, the language is simple, but maybe too simple. So 
how does generics actually help us? Well, for example, stronger uh, type checks at compile time, which means that we now can represent the content of the lists. So, for example, the, uh, the example we had before, that will actually be caught on compile time. Also, we don't need to write costs. They will still be there, that's a different story, and we will take that later, but we don't need to write them. So we, we're guaranteed that this that we're getting, we'll get an integer. So before we start to dig in a little in the details, does anyone actually know what the inspiration for generics in Java was? Has anyone actually heard this? So this is actually really interesting because the inspiration for generics is actually from functional languages. And it came from ML and Haskell. So it is parametric polymorphism that you can find in ML and Haskell. And what's really interesting here is that uh, Butler, which is one of the creators of generic Java, he also worked on Haskell. Another famous name who worked on uh, generics in Java is uh, Martin Odersky, more known for Scala. So a lot of actually functional uh, relationships there with generics. And generics was actually created to look like C++ templates, but they are semantically different in the meaning that while they look the same, C++ templates, they work in a different way. They will expand and have one, uh, have a one instantiation for each type. And as we will see with generics, when we get into the details there, they work very differently. So let's compare uh, generics with, for example, arrays. How do uh, generics uh, contribute to the Java language and what do they contribute? And we're going to compare them now to arrays to see some of the difference. So an important concept here is subtyping. We can say that integer is a subtype of number because it, it extends number. And we can also say that integer is a subtype of itself. So, and there's, um, and there's also the concept of variance, where this describes more of a relationship between more complex types, such as arrays and lists. So if we take a look at, for example, arrays, they are so-called covariant, which means that since integer is a subtype of number, the an array of integers is also a subtype of an array of numbers. And this is kind of intuitive. You feel that this, so this sounds good and it has to be good. And you can, for example, see it in the sort function in the, in the Java arrays class, where it takes some kind of uh, object array and it sorts it. But does anyone actually know and realize any problem here with this approach. Yeah, so one of the problems here is, for example, we have to, all of the items have to implement the comparable interface. Otherwise, class cast, cast exception again. Another problem is that, for example, say we have an array of integers and we refer to it by using a number array reference. So now we have numbers, it's backed by an integer array. Does anyone see any danger here? Yes? Exactly. I might put something else that is a subtype of number. And that is exactly what I will do now. I mean, is it so crazy that I'll put a, <laughs> a double to it? I mean, it's a number, it's also a number. And the interesting part here is that we can't catch this at compile time. So this, will this type checking will fail runtime. And it is covariance that uh, gets us in trouble. So uh, this actually surprised me a lot when I saw it, but uh, so it's, it's a tricky one. So, but considering that arrays were designed before generics, this was basically the only way we could do them. However, now when generics are available, maybe um, 
the arrays should work differently. So the contrast to this is how generics works with collections. And they are invariant. So what does that mean? Well, invariance is that I even if integer is a subtype of number, a list of integers is not a subtype of numbers. And this some might sound strange, considering how arrays work, but it, re it really does help us in many cases. So if we take a look at the problem that we saw before, where we had an, we had an array of ints and we assigned it to an array of uh, numbers, if we try to do, if we have an array, of, if we have a list of integers and we try to assign it to a list of numbers, then that will actually be a compile time error. So we, the compiler will actually stop us from doing this and we won't discover it after the hours in production. It will actually stop directly. So, but this is kind of inflexible. What if we actually need to put things in it? What if we actually need to read from it? Well, then there's the concept of wildcards, where we can reintroduce variants in different ways. So, for example, we might need to calculate the sum of a list. We don't care if it's integers or doubles, we just want to be able to calculate it. And there are, of course, ways around these limitations, and they're a part of the very hard uh, example that I showed before. And to our help, we're going to use the get and put principle. Now, bear with me because we haven't seen the actual wildcards yet, but this is actually the guiding principle, and it's, uh, it's taken from uh, Wadler's book about the generics and collection, a super good book. I probably the best Java book I've ever read, so I really, really recommend it if you haven't read it. So we're going to use an extends wildcard when we want to get values, and we're going to use a super wildcard to put values. And if we want to both get and put, well, we actually can't use wildcards. So let's take a look at that. Let's start with the extends. Now, the important part here is that extends does not only mean that it has to extends, it can also be implements. So it's uh, somewhat misleading here. So if we take and look at probably a similar example as we've always seen, we have a list of integers here called temp, and we can add to it. Nothing strange here. But then we'll use the wildcard. We'll say extends integer and call it ints. And then we'll try to add to it. So as you might uh, already be thinking, this is actually a compile time error. So it will, it will stop us before we do this. Now, this being a compile time error does not mean that the collection is immutable. We can still rearrange it, we can still remove things, but it, uh, it does stop us from adding. But if it's you want immutability, then there are other solutions for it. And we can still read from it without any problems. The other interesting wildcard here is super. And that is if we actually want to put something in the collection. So if we ha have a uh, similar example again, we'll have a list ints, and it, it, uh, we have super int, integer. Then we can add without any problems. And maybe as you can guess, we can't get anything from it. So these two can be, it's easy to mix them up. And a good uh, reference for this is from the Java API the copy method. And here we have the get and put principle basically explained in a very easy way. If you want to put, well, we use super. We have a destination here. If, if we have extends, well, we want to get, and that is the source. So copy is a very good example here for the get and put principle. A special case of uh, wildcards is the unknown type, as it's called. And this is actually not nothing special. It is a special, it is basically extends object. 
And this is for the cases where we, for example, we're not interested in the content. We're more interested in, for example, it's the reverse here. We want to change the position. So here is the basically, I don't care what you contain. I just want to do some kind of operation to you. And if we compare this with, for example, this one and two here, so what is the difference if you want to use this wildcard and you just use list? Anyone want to take a guess? Well, the, uh, so if we begin with number two, this is, actually, this is something called a raw type. And basically what that is, is it's a deprecated type. And it says, yeah, I'm not interested in type safety. The compiler will give you an unchecked warning and basically you won't have any type checking for it. While number one will actually perform type checking and it will put limitations on what operations you can do. So number one is recommended and number two, avoid them. So we've hinted a little about how generics work, but now it's actually, let's take a look under the hood. And this is actually really interesting because Generics were added about nine years after Java was created. So that's a like, very long delay. And the delay was not because they didn't see the value of generics. It was because basically they were not clear how to make them work right. So one important thing was that they didn't want to break backwards compa compatibility. And this is sometimes called the main directive of Java development, never break backwards compatibility. So they wanted to make sure that code that was written with generics would work with the older code that was written without, and without recompiling. So they wanted actually stronger than backwards compatibility, they wanted binary compatibility. And that's uh, much more tricky. And the solution, a controversial one, was so-called type erasure. And type erasure is somewhat of a misleading name because it's not really del erasure in that sense. But we'll, we'll get to that, those details there. It's, it's a somewhat bad expression. So what happens here is that, for example, we can declare a list of strings, a list of integers, and this information will be used compile time and it will ensure type safety. But then when that uh, type safety check is performed, it is then deleted. So at the runtime, it will look like it did before with raw, basically raw types. And this does lead to some really interesting uh, uh, edge cases. For example, if we have a list of apples and we have a list of candies, and we then ask, well, are these the same class? Well, Java would say, of course, they're the same. They're both list. But uh, I mean, if you ask uh, any kid or any <laughs> other person, then a the list of apples and a list of candies are not the same thing. So, the, but it's another thing that is actually quite important here is that even though we can actually get items from these lists, we can get that uh, apple and we can get that candy we cannot say how the list was actually declared. Because, I mean, it could be declared as a list of objects. It could be in a declared as a list of fruits. Or it could have been declared as a list of apples. We, can, we cannot know. So we cannot backwards uh, somewhat uh, figure out how it was declared, unfortunately. And type erasure has led to a number of limitations. For example, we cannot create generic arrays. And the reason for that we cannot do this is because arrays are actually so-called refined types. It, the type information that is known at compile time is also available at runtime. While in the case of uh, generics, it is, it is deleted after compile time. So we just don't have that information and it's considered an error to with generic array creation. Another limitation is that we can, for example, overload on generic information. This is also because the erasure gives the same thing. We bo in the both these examples, we will have a list. Uh, we have will have some type of list, so it won't work here either. But 
probably the, m the most famous limitation, and the actually what is considered the worst, is we cannot have generics over primitives. So if we want to have something like a list of ints, we can't. And the reason for this is actually on two levels. On a, on a language level, we cannot represent an int as some kind of reference. And therefore, we cannot have it. And also the same thing on the virtual machine level. We cannot represent operations such as return both a reference and a primitive type. So what we're forced to do is the famous, we have to box them. So we have to use integers. And this, of course, comes with a performance penalty. And it has, we have seen like now in streams and stuff that we have to have things like in streams to not totally destroy performance. So this is really, generics is really starting to show a, a little long tooth here. So I may mentioned before that the compiler will insert costs for us. Uh, actually, we got that from the audience also. Uh, so, how is that safer? I mean, really, the compiler is, uh, why is that more correct than if we do it? Let's take one. And the reason is, there is a guarantee that these costs by the compiler will never fail with a star. <laughs> And uh, very, there is a condition for this. And, the, and in order to discuss this condition, we have to remember two things. Java is so-called statically typed. That means that every type and every expression has a known type at compile time. It is also strongly typed, which means that basically it limits the operations that you can do on these expressions. And when we get these unchecked warnings, that means basically not that we, don't, we haven't done any type checking, it's that we can't do sufficient type checking. And this means that the costs inserted by the compiler may fail. So any unchecked uh, warning means that basically you can have a cost fail. So this is actually really, really dangerous. And the de decision to actually use type erasure is considered really controversial. I mean, it's so controversial that actually in the Java language specification, they defend it. So in case you're reading it, they will actually defend it. And this is the exact quote that... But... So generics gets a lo lot of flack for some of these limitations, but there were actually some advantages to it. For example, it didn't need any J VM changes at all. We got significantly better type safety of collections with basically no runtime cost. We got gradual migration without any problems. The generics could be made generic without the client. No problems at all. So it wasn't all bad, but it wasn't all good either. So before we're going to discuss Project Valhalla now, which is a project that started a few years ago with some interesting changes. But as with all future projects, there are some disclaimers. This might not happen, and everything I say might be false tonight, tomorrow, next week. We don't know. Everything might change, so we don't know. Say that we have, for example, this point class. And this is something we'll have today. And say that we want to store an array of these points. Then we would not actually get an array of points. We would get an array of references to points. So I mean what is so what is the problem with this representation? So in this case, maybe not so much, but say we have millions of them. And we're going to calculate them all. Then we have to follow every reference, which might be a cache miss. Also, we have to allocate these objects with their, their headers and everything, which is also a memory overhead that we maybe we don't may need. What we more want is maybe something like this. And the point is that we could 
actually encode this by hand. But in doing so, we actually have to sacrifice the abstraction of the point class in order to gain performance. And there we might also sacrifice correctness and other things. So the first thing that Project Valhalla was about was the value types. And value types were basically, we instead, we would declare this as value class point. And we would get automatically something more like the second example. So basically, this comes with a few costs. We wouldn't have any identity. We wouldn't have any polymorphism since it wouldn't have a super or a subclass. And it wouldn't be mutable or nullable. But it would in generally work like a class. But it w the performance would be more like an int. So it's sold under, it will code like a class, but it will work basically like an int. So basically the behavior that we expect for ints would then also be valid for value types. But this also, if we loop back to the subject of this presentation, as we said, we cannot have generics and primitives. And this goes also for uh, value types. So the value types will have to interact with other parts of the language, uh, reflection, serialization, core libraries, and of course generics, but generics won't suppo can't support them. And suddenly, this limitation in generics, it became a little too much. So in Project Valhalla, there's also a part which is basically called enhanced generics. And this will be an extension of generics. So one problem that we're faced with and that we mentioned before, in order to support primitive types, on a language level, there, there are some limitations because many generic classes are written as such as T and object would be interchangeable, that the type T is actually nulled sometimes. So these classes won't work if we actually start, uh, if we're able to actually provide them with ints, for example. So the first conclusion and the first change of enhanced generics will be that you can actually op you opt in for enhanced generics. And this is done by a new keyword, and it's called enu. So basically, we have a box, we have a box class here. And enu here says that this will, be able, will, this will be a reference type, or it can be a primitive. It can be either. But the thing is, you opt in to it. So this won't break any older classes. But also, we, had this, we have the same, we have, while we now solved it on a language level, we still have a problem, as we had before with primitives, that the virtual machine does not support these operations for both references and primitive types. So, the pro so what do we have different solutions here. One might be that maybe we extend the Java bytecode, but that is pretty extensive. So what we're looking at right now is something called hybrid translation. And what this will mean is basically that reference types in enhanced generics will work as before. However, the primitives will probably work more like C++ templates, where we get specialized code for each type. And that will bring in a slighter perfor per that will allow us to have generics over both primitives and references. But there's a lot of work still to be done. And as uh, Simon said, Simon Ritter, also known uh, for his work on JVM, it's a, don it's a daunting task. And he doesn't envy Brian Guts for it. Also, I believe that uh, James Gosling said basically that uh, Brian Guts and the team had signed up for six uh, PhDs, basically, when they, when they took on value types. So there's a lot of work to be done, but uh, hopefully it will be there for Java 10. So now comes the fun part. Questions? <laughs>